Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. The good news, the gospel, the good news is Christ. It's our message, it's our ministry, it's our life. It concerns redemption, it re concerns salvation, and it concerns doctrine. It deals with uh, both past, uh, present, and future. And we need to define the word world. In Scripture, the word cosmos, world, mostly is seen in the context of the world religious system. It's, that is anything that opposes the will and the work of God in our lives. The gospel defines true ministry. Uh, believing it doesn't make it true. It's true whether or not you believe it or not. There are many things that God has done for you as a believer in Christ. Those things are not dependent upon whether you have faith in those things or not or believe those things to be true or not. It shadows our Lord's own ministry. Believing it doesn't make it true. We are the aliens. We are fixated on Him, not ourselves. We long to depart and to be with Him. But we also know the value of our presence here. I know the anguish of uncertainty, uh, doubt, and confusion. Experienced by those who are searching for answers, searching for truth. I know that confusion and doubt are our enemies and that confusion, doubt, and uncertainty have run amok. And I believe that there are multitudes of Christians who are hurting and despondent. If you are one of those Christians, then this video is for you. I believe it is timely. I believe that there is a sense of urgency in the message that we proclaim that we are living in perilous times. So I want to go over a few things with you. Uh, and I have chosen a uh, background here that might enable me to put some words up on the screen to help my... Perhaps maybe that'll help make this a little easier to uh, comprehend. I want to begin with the fact that there was the age of law. It was the age of law. And the major definition of that period of human history was that if you do this, then uh, you'll be blessed. Uh, with the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord came uh, the second major period of human history that period which God calls grace, uh, were that we do because, because we've been so blessed. And then there's the kingdom age. The kingdom age is the third major period of human history. It begins with a world transforming event, the return of Christ, uh, the establishment of his earthly rule, uh, where that the law is written upon hearts, and minds. But you are living in the age of grace in which God is not imputing men's trespasses against them. Now, as I've shared with you folks over a period of time, uh, nearly six, I guess, well, six years now and, and, and running, we are born again above, from above by God. Scripture is clear on this. Uh, we, we know that from Matthew, Deuteronomy, uh, 1 John, uh, the book of John. We were promised to Christ. We know that from 1 Peter and 1 John. 
as well as 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, and Colossians. And I have stated on numerous occasions that new birth precedes personal belief or acceptance of Christ. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's because you were born from God, by God, from above. It is not that you were born again because you did something. Life had to be infused. You had to be quickened to life, quickened from the dead, before you could have the ability to believe, receive, or accept. That is not a popular concept today within Christianity. One of the most serious topics that we could discuss is, is how that we're born again by the will of God. Faith being a result of that new birth, which is the gospel. The natural man is in bondage to his fallen will. God's grace is central to the gospel. We know that from John 1.13, 1 Corinthians 1.30, 1 Corinthians 2.14, and Ephesians 2.5. The reason for that is because man is spiritually dead. He's dead, spiritually dead. He has no ability to believe or receive or accept Jesus Christ because he's spiritually dead. He has to be quickened to life first. God has an order or an arrangement of things that are in order, and it's that proper order that we preach. God chose us, we didn't choose Him, no man seeks after God. We were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. We were predestined, called, and justified by God. The spiritual picture of Jesus choosing His disciples, it's, it's no different in our lives. We know that from Ephesians 1.4, Romans 3.11, John 15, and Romans 8.30. All three of the following realities are a work of God, our physical birth, our new birth, and our heavenly celestial birth, which we re often refer to as the rapture, of which we had and will have nothing to do with. We know that from Jeremiah chapter 1, John chapter 1, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. God has forgiven us of all sin, past, present, and future. Our sins have been cast as far as the east is from the west, buried in the depths of the sea to be remembered no more. The sin issue has been forever settled. We know this from Colossians, Psalms, Jeremiah, Micah, yet many Christians today are despondent over the fact that they're just of, of the uncertainty in their minds whether they've been even been forgiven or not. We are made the righteousness of God in Christ. How often do you hear that preached? How often do you go to church and you hear the pastor say that you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ? Probably not very often. We are called saints. We stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. And this position that we stand in is unchangeable. We know this from Ephesians 1 and Romans chapter 3. Our new nature did not eradicate our sinful nature. The two are in constant conflict with one another. That's 1 John chapter 1, Galatians chapter 5, and Romans chapter 7. God has nothing to do with that flesh, with that old nature, that sin nature. It'll never change. It'll only become worse over time. Listen, dearly beloved. It will become worse over time. If God left us here for several hundred years, I don't think that you would like that because your old man would become so corrupt as, as to be almost unbearable. 
The Christian life is not cleaning up that old man. It, it is why we had to be made a new creation where that Christ could dwell, where that he could abide. The new man cannot sin. We know that from John chapter 6, 2 Corinthians 5, Galatians 6, 1 John 3, and John chapter 5. We are to daily reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive unto God. It's, it's a vital, ongoing activity, and it is our first command given us in Romans chapter 6, verse 11. All righteousness is of the Lord. All righteousness is of the Lord. His righteousness is imputed unto us, and that same righteousness becomes evident in our experience as we believe in and we trust God. It is the righteousness that is based on faith, not law. We can never become any more righteous by what we do. Let that seep in. We know this from Romans 3, Romans 1, Romans 5, and John chapter 5. The righteousness of God is manifest uh, through two means, the fruit of the Spirit and the manifest life of Christ Himself. As branches, we are to abide in the vine through whom it is produced. We know that from Galatians 5, 2 Corinthians 2, and 1 John 15. We are to rest in God's timing as it regards our spiritual growth. Let that seep in. This includes times of dryness and desert, uh, which we pass through. Hebrews chapter 4 and Job chapter 23. We have died not only to sin, but self, the law, the world, Satan, and death. We've died to six things. And unless we have died to the law, we cannot live unto God. We cannot bear fruit unto God. That's Romans chapter 6, Galatians 2, Romans 7, Galatians uh, 6, John chapter 5, 1 John 5, and John chapter 5. You just got to ask yourself why these things are not being taught today from the pulpit. Law serves no place in the believer's life except to drive us to Christ who is our life. It is through the law in which the knowledge of sin comes uh, and the very strength of sin is the law. The law is not made for a righteous man and that's who you are. That's uh, Romans chapter 3, 1 Corinthians 15, Romans 3, Galatians 3, Romans 7, Galatians 2. God always loves us. He doesn't allow anything to touch our lives except it be for our ultimate good. That's a hard one to settle in on. He always has our best in mind, doesn't matter what it is. And He always causes us to triumph. Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 2, and Romans 1. God is supremely sovereign over every minute detail of our lives. There's not one instance, one second, one moment in which He's not. He promises to complete that which He began in us. Uh, he promises to remain faithful even when we are not. He promised never to leave us nor forsake us. Heaven is certain and assured. 2 Timothy 2, Philippians 1, Philippians 2, 1 Kings 8, John 5, and 1 John 3. We are to enter into this rest of His, ceasing from our own works as He did from His when He lived in complete dependence upon the Father who worked through Him. And dearly beloved, listen to me. Why would Christians today think that they could do on their own what Christ himself refused to do when he was here in the flesh. If his life was one in which, which was of dependence upon the Father, why would ours be any different? We know that from John 5, Matthew 23, in, in fact, the entire chapter, uh, Galatians, the entire epistle, uh, in hundreds more verses that are woven throughout the, the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. 
The believer living under grace, not law, undergoes the same identical uh, type of persecution by this world religious system as Christ did. And which is an unjustified hatred without a cause. That's John chapter 15. Such persecution leads us, leads, it, leads us to further spiritual growth in grace and knowledge of Christ. Matthew 5, Luke 6, 2 Peter 3, and Romans 8. It is astounding to me that we have been redeemed, reconciled, regenerated, justified, forgiven, born again, accepted, sealed, cleansed, chosen, indwelt, saved, sanctified, transformed, adopted, made a new creature, creation, uh, delivered, made a joint heir in Christ, seated in the heavenlies, hid with Christ in God, made a citizen of heaven, given eternal life, propiti God is propitiated, We've been given the righteousness of Christ. We've been granted very great and special promises. We've been made a conqueror. We've been made to stand. We've been joined to the body of Christ. We've been gifted. We've been granted full assurance. We've been made a son of God. We've been given peace. We've been given mercy. We've been loved by God. We've been given understanding. We've been given free access to God. And you have multitudes of Christians around the world who are hurting and confused, and in doubt, and in despair. Why? Because they don't know these things. They're not being told these things. John 10, 27 is very clear. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. Galatians 1.15, but when God who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by His grace. John 1.13, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. John 6, uh, and this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which He hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 16, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and we continue. Well, or the world continues to teach just the opposite. That we choose Him. When Scripture is quite clear that we do not, that He chose us. The phrase in Christ appears 75 times in the King James Version of the Bible. I don't have enough room on this screen to put all the verses up there. In Christ. In Christ. J James 1.18, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. James 1.18. So here, here's it pretty much in a nutshell here. It's, it's because you could not choose that you had to be chosen uh, because not all were chosen. Atonement was limited to those who were. And to make this certain, grace had to be irresistible because you could not resist. Your destiny is certain. We know this from the following verses. The gospel today that is preached is synergistic. It's man must cooperate with God. God did his part, but man must do the rest. And folks, that is a lie. It's just a lie. God did much, much more than just make redemption and salvation possible for his people he's the author and the finisher of our faith now we say that we often hear people say that but we really really don't mean what we're saying either he's the either he's the author and finisher of our faith or he's not 
Now, personally, I don't think he lied. There is what they call synergism, cooperative activity between man and God. It takes both to accomplish anything. And then there's the monergistic, monergism view, which is the gospel. The gospel is monergistic. A dead man cannot save himself. And so we are the circumcision, the ones who serve by the Spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Dearly beloved, you can tell a Christian, you can tell a ministry, you can tell a church by what it proclaims. It's, it's really not all that complicated. Either they're preaching Jesus Christ or they're not. They're either glorying in Christ or they're not. They're either boasting in Christ or they're not. They're either preaching the person in the work of Jesus Christ or they are not. Or they've, they've somehow twisted it all around to make it seem as if or sound as if that God can't do anything unless you cooperate with God. And folks, that is not the truth. It's just not. God made, me, well, Steve, Pastor Steve, I don't, you know, you can't tell me that God makes people love him. Well, he made me love him. He made me love him by first loving me. Why can't we put God first, folks? God up here, man down here, instead of reversing God's order and preaching law, not grace. Why can't we do that? You know, I, we, that's what we do. We, we're preaching law, not grace, by reversing God's order. We've got to put, we cannot put the cart before the horse. Why should it be so difficult to grasp in our understanding that God, God first, man second? Why would we want to reverse the order and go man first, God second? The truth is, folks, is you don't decide what you are or, or who you are. You discover who you are. The Word of God will show you who you are. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of the fact and what the fact that what you need to know and understand is, is that God has done a work in your life as a believer in Christ. He's, he's done a tremendous work that, that you probably, most Christians, I would venture to say, haven't really fully wrapped their mind around. He's done a great work, a tremendous work in, a, in, a, in, in every single believer's life. I'm, I'm talking from the least to the greatest, and it makes no difference at all whether you believe X, Y, or Z to be true or not. It is true of you whether you believe it or not. That is the message you need to hear. You know, you may not feel forgiven. Doesn't mean you're not. You may not feel that you're fit for heaven, but it doesn't mean you're not. We're, these are matters of faith, dearly beloved. And it is my desire, it's always been the desire of this ministry, that we would grow in grace and knowledge of Him, not ourselves, and not what we think we must do for God in order for God to do something for us. We do because He's done. We don't do so that he will do. I don't know how to put it any plainer than that. We've uh, crossed the six year mark. We've, uh, we're probably looking at, I don't know, over 800 videos since we began. And in every single one, if you just stop to take notice, the emphasis, the focus is on Christ, not ourselves. Anyone who has a rational mind, it, it just, to me, it do, doesn't seem like that they could argue against that. Why would we not see God as who He is? Well, because we have a lot of distraction, a lot of enemies, enemies of the faith, 
most of the enemies of, our, of, of the faith of your faith, those which which you would you would I would consider I would suggest are your enemies, are not external. They're not people out there. They're not your enemies. Your enemies are concepts, constructs of the mind which which try to convince you that somehow you've got to satisfy an angry God by, you know, appease some angry God by something that you do to gain favor with God, to get in right with God by doing something that will make God pleased with you. Christ did that. I love you all. I truly do. Join us on Sunday as we study through 2 Corinthians verse by verse. We're in the 12th chapter. Until then, Rest in Him. And this is Steve. Thanks for watching.